Hello, everybody. First, I would like to thank Professor Phelps and the Center for bringing us all together. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces and to have the opportunity to meet new interesting people and to feel as part of a community again. I've been asked to speak on Europe. Europe is at a tipping point as it faces grace, grave challenges, but also has great opportunities. Let's begin with the challenges. First, I will highlight social tensions within countries. For instance, my home country, Germany. Germany has been one of the most successful countries in managing the pandemic with comparatively few deaths. Nevertheless, on a sunny day in late August last year, almost 40,000 people congregated in Berlin to protest the government's COVID-19 restrictions and the quote-unquote mask slavery. Around 3,000 of these people were members of the far-right scene, carrying flags and other insignia of the former imperial Germany. As the sun was setting, several hundreds of them tried to storm the Reichstag, the parliament building. The violent mob vastly outnumbered police forces, tore down security barriers, screamed anti-democratic slogans, and made it as far as the steps leading to the entry. Germans were shocked at this attempted takeover of the symbol of German democracy as it elicited dark memories of the past. In France, a far-right conspiracy theorist, Rémy Daillet, has just been charged with terrorism over a plot to overthrow the French government in what is called Operation Azur. Within just a few months, he had managed to amass a group of several hundred members, which included army officers, policemen, doctors, and lawyers. They had made preparations to seize the Elysee Palace, Parliament Ministries, and a broadcasting station using firearms and explosives. In April, the 60th anniversary of a failed coup d'etat in France, 1,000 servicemen, including about 20 retired generals, announced in an open letter that the army might have to seize power to avoid deadly civil war because Islamists were taking over whole parts of France. Since the Yellow Vest riots in Paris in 2018 and 19, the French administration has taken such threats of a bloody coup much more seriously. Italy has also seen its share of unrest with strikes, protests, and alarming violence, primarily driven by the neo-fascist group Forza Nuova. In October, around um, 10,000 people marched through Rome in protest against stringent corona measures. Hundreds of them had planned to storm the presidential palace and democratic institutions. Diverted by the police, they instead rampaged the offices of a major labor union which had supported the government measures. There are many more examples of unrest simmering in other European countries. These tensions are a manifestation of a widespread dissatisfaction, and if you take a step back and connect the dots, you can see a pattern emerging. It's important to point out that these groups don't only consist of far-right wing extremists, which to be clear are still on the fringes. The protesters are very diverse. It's just that far right groups often take the lead to bring together these dissenting voices, which include angry business owners, upset parents, anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists. They are united in their shared distrust of the elite, institutions, liberal values and science. Their disdain is the result of various developments, such as globalization, technological innovation, and immigration, which have disrupted their lives and their sense of identity. They regard the European Union as a technocratic bureaucracy, as deceptive and exploitative. For them, the European Union is a common, the European Union, the common currency, and monetary stabilization measures are not democratically legitimized, but merely a transmission mechanism for the enrichments of the elites. The corona pandemic has exacerbated existing frictions and brought those amorphous disintegrative forces to the surface. Secondly, there are conflicts in between countries. 
On the most basic level, frictions go to the very core of the common community, namely its values and culture. Two of the most right-wing governments, Poland and Hungary, reject many of the community's shared values, for instance, with regard to an independent judiciary, media freedom, and the protection of rights of minorities, such as members of the LGBTQ community. Poland also asserts that its domestic law takes precedence over EU law. However, it is EU law that has primacy over national law, and member states are required to follow a common rule book. In order to discipline Poland, the EU is withholding billions of euros that Poland is actually due to receive from the COVID-19 recovery fund. The Polish government's response, fine, you don't fo fork over the money that is owed to us, then we will block every single important decision that you will try to push through. Hungary has also been at odds with the European Commission over its judiciary, which the Hungarian government has tried to bring under its control. In contrast to Poland, though, Hungary has not challenged the authority of the European Court of Justice and complied with its rulings. Monetary and fiscal policies have also set member countries on a collision course. As has been well established, the design of the single currency contains a fundamental flaw. Um, as member states were assumed to be on the same level based on formal accession criteria, when in reality they had all very different economies. And while member countries can make their own fiscal policies, they must adhere to EU debt and deficit rules. As a result, many of them have had to operate within a framework that didn't really suit them and was counterproductive for them. The bifurcation between economically and financially stronger core countries such as Germany and weaker countries in the periphery has exacerbated economic and financial issues. The EU has rendered support, but has in return imposed austerity and structural reforms, which have typically led to economic stagnation and rising unemployment. The pandemic has put a strain on all member countries' economy, but particularly those in the periphery. High inflation, especially record energy prices, potentially endanger the fragile economic recovery and might derail the Green Deal, at least in parts, which is a one trillion a Euro 10-year plan of the European Union. The reasons for the inflation are similar as in the United States and the risk are also very similar. To avoid social unrest and political upheaval, the community should jumpstart growth by increasing spending. Since before COVID-19, public and private investments have been very low, while private savings have been high. In view of these facts and due to the low borrowing costs, it would be feasible to loosen fiscal rules to take on more debt to invest in productive assets because revenues would exceed the low borrowing costs. However, debt typically sparks concerns about financial stability, particularly in Germany. On a side note, the German word for debt is Schuld, which literally means guilty. So, uh, guilt as in guilty. Yeah. So Germans have a reflexive negative association with the concept. I can confirm this because I grew up in Germany and I was taught by my parents that the worst thing you can do is to take on debt. And if you absolutely have to, like say for a mortgage, it is the utmost priority to pay it back as soon as possible. During the pandemic, Germany has made available virtually unlimited credit to German businesses but it has justified these measures by saying, well, we, were, we had such great um, dis budget discipline that now we can afford it because basically we were, you know, saved money beforehand. The new um, government in, in Germany, which is a three-party coalition, has agreed on the need to make investments, though on the basis of sustainable finances. Germany has a provision in the Constitution, which is called the debt break. Um, and what it does, it says that in order to maintain a balanced budget, it limits annual government borrowing. There have been voices which have pled for the abolition of the debt break, but that probably won't happen. 
There is, however, a loophole because due to corona, the debt break was temporarily suspended and will only be reactivated in 2023. That provides the possibility for taking on new debt in 2022, which is one of the greatest worries of the conservatives. The ECB <clears throat> finds itself in the midst of competing forces and must walk a fine line of maintaining financial stability while not stifling growth. Particularly, rising inflation is, of course, a challenge for the ECB because if it turns out to be more persistent, it, it will be in a dilemma as it has to be careful not to risk the weaker country's ability to finance themselves. The ECB's purchase of government bonds has been criticized because there is supposed to be a strict separation between monetary and fiscal policy, and the ECB is prohibited from financing countries. Germany, in particular, has been concerned with monetary stability and excess and the transformation into a transfer union. The German Central Bank Bundesbank has typically been opposed to increasingly unconventional policies, though it ultimately has always come to support them. Meanwhile, the influence of orthodox conservative voices has been waning since a decade of low inflation, uh, despite those loose monetary policies, has weakened their case. The president of the Bundesbank, Jens Weidmann, will depart in December to the great dismay of many German policymakers and economists who saw him as a moderating influence. In December, the ECB, uh, just when he's leaving, the ECB will also wind down the 1.85 trillion uh, euro pandemic emergency purchase program, PEPP, and it must then decide um, what it will do after that, it could potentially lose restrictions in the bond buying program, PSPP. While the EU is confronted <clears throat> with numerous fundamental challenges, there are also unifying forces which increase cohesion. First of all, there are cross-border issues such as the pandemic, trade disputes, climate change, the energy crisis, digitization, immigration, Brexit, and slowing global growth. Then there are international threats resulting from Russia's aggression, China's antagonism, and the US's unreliability. Economic interdependence and the defense of shared geostrategic and economic interests are a good opportunity to make policy decisions which will create a union that is more politically and economically sustainable as has been made now uh, during the corona crisis with measures such as the post-pandemic stimulus plan, which I mentioned earlier, and the next generation EU recovery fund. Also, the uh, European Commission has just established a process to explore the reformation of the Stability and Growth Pact, according to which budget deficits must not exceed 3% of GDP and national debt must not exceed 60% of GDP. And that provision has been a cornerstone it's a long story. Um, but in response to the um, pandemic emergency, this has been, this uh, stability and growth pact has been temporarily suspended. Of course, debt should be reduced, but at a speed and in a manner that won't derail growth. Another vital issue is how the EU will handle the cultural clash over values. The EU's policy tools to impose disciplines on countries like Poland and Hungary are limited. It can take fin financial or legal action, but legal action is of limited effectiveness because rogue countries, like take for instance Poland and Hungary, they protect each other in the voting process. There is no mechanism to expel a member state. So will we see an Italexit, a Polexit, a Hungarexit, Opinion polls have shown that about 70% of Europeans are in support of the Union. In Poland, even 85% of the population is in favor of staying in the EU. Most people trust the European Union's processes and checks and balances, sometimes more than those in their own countries and their own national politicians and institutions. Also, Brexit has served as a deterrent with visuals of endless lines of trucks, empty store shelves, and sheer chaos. By now, most people realize that you can't just pull the plug of a complex system and expect things to go revert back to the past. 
Another lesson from Brexit, the negotiating power rests with the community and it cannot be blackmailed. Complex endeavors move forward through crises. Such crises concentrate policymakers' minds and are a great opportunity to facilitate and accelerate further integration. Lessons from history teach us that we have to fight to protect our democracy, our values, and economic foundations because humans can only flourish in a society that works for all people. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions for Sandra? I just wanted to ask your opinion about uh, what is a general uh, sort of uh, belief in Poland that, you know, when you are talking about these challenges, that essentially the uh, court decision that the Polish constitution is superior to the EU law, that the same decision was taken by the court in Germany in May of 2018 in France, Italy, in some other countries. The same thing with the nomination of judges, that the judges are nominated by the parliament. This is true in Germany, this is true in many other European countries. So, uh, you know, in Poland is regarded that Germany, which runs the European Union, is being extremely hypocritical because they don't like the conservative government in Poland. It has nothing to do with the substance of the issue. Uh, and actually the government support is extremely strong. So um, I think that uh, you should, uh, when you are talking about it, you should at least give the two sides of the issue. And I can go into detail on the other things as well. Yes, thank you for your question. Well, when it gets down to the legal details, it gets quite technical, but there's a fundamental issue with the German court decision that you mentioned, because that doesn't doubt the um, supremacy or the primacy of uh, European Union law. Um, so the um, challenge of the Polish court is much more fundamental. It's not what the Polish say. It's, um, I guess it's arguable, but there are so many issues that also play into that, like the values that I mentioned, free press, for instance, in Hungary or you know minority rights, uh, there are some things that c are coming together because otherwise the relationship seems to be very antagonistic. Because usually with Merkel at the head, you know she was always able to negotiate compromises and somehow come together, but it seems like here we are really on a collision course. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, you said that, that, or you criticized the European Commission for imposing structural reforms on periphery countries. I'm sorry? Sorry, you, you said that and you criticized the fact that the European Commission imposes structural reforms on periphery countries. But as someone that worked on the treasury of one of those countries, the one thing I, I'm sorry for is not imposing more structural reforms. And uh, it's impossible to deny the lack of quality or the difference in quality of institutions when we compare say, France, Germany, Netherlands, versus Portugal, where I worked, and Spain and Italy. And so my question to you is, if you don't agree with structural reforms, how do you propose that there's a convergence, not so much in terms of income, but in terms of quality of institutions, say, fiscal rules, uh, public bidding, transparency, because those are real issues for, for Southern European countries. Well, thank you for your question. Um, well, this was a very short general speech. And as you said, there are great differences between individual countries. Um, you know, when we watch the, uh, how the process went in Greece, there is just a danger that the union has been overproportionately influenced by Germany and German rules and German thinking. And there are certainly some good points that Germans have, but their recipes cannot be translated to every single country, first of all, and second of all, they must not come across as patronizing. And for that reason, I think Merkel was a good leader um, because um, it's not just technical issues, it's also you know, interpersonal issues to some extent. And I'm not against structural reforms. Of course, there are things that can be improved, like if we look at, at a country 
like Greece, but I'm arguing from the German perspective, which tends to be too stringent, and you know you must adhere to the rules, and you cannot, and our rules, and I think it, I think there should be more leeway. Not every country is the same, and not every recipe fits every country to the same extent. ask you to read one of the most profound sentences I've ever heard, the last sentence of your presentation. Oh, mm -hmm. to, re to read my last sentence? Last sentence, one of the most profound sentences I've ever heard. Lessons from history teach us that we have, have to fight to protect our democracy, our values, and our economic foundations. Did I say that right? Let me start again. I messed up my most important. That wasn't the last sentence. No, the, 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 I think you mean the second half of the last sentence. Lesson from history teaches us that we have to fight to protect our democracy, our values and economic foundations, because humans can only flourish in a society that works for all. And I think that goes very much to the point that Martin Wolf made during lunch. Um, it goes to what I have had to observe over the last few years here uh, under Trump. Um, and so I'm very sensitive to these issues, probably also because of my German history. So if every citizen believes that, that's great. I think we all, we all need to participate in the democratic process and we can't just point upwards to people in power. Yes, thank you so much. I was reading about the pervasive effects that Brexit has had on the British economy, the UK economy. Has there been also a pervasive effect of the European unions has suffered from Brexit as much? On the, has it had great, the same effect on Europe? Yes, pervasive effects. Not that, I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but not to the extent that I can see just just because you know that's a big union and it can ca kind of compensate for Britain not being part of it anymore and of course if, if there are effects they're probably harder to spot in Britain we really can see it you know immediately the immediate effects and they're quite dramatic I think it was the biggest mistake biggest obvious mistake to ever make any other questions Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for your attention.